always a great time, uh, especially if you're a dentist. Uh, we'll be, uh, if you're decorating a trunk, uh, please be here at 4 o'clock uh, so they can get you in place and get you set up because they're going to start right at 5. And they'll be serving hot dogs and chips and water. It'll be a great time. Everyone is invited to that. Uh, our annual commitment campaign for 2020 uh, is underway now. We hope that you'll keep that in your prayers as we move closer to Commitment Sunday, which is November the 10th. Uh, we welcome Mike Beer here as our speaker this Sunday. Mike. Good morning, church. I'd like to think of myself as a simple person. I try to live by the golden rule and the Cub Scout motto, which is to do your best. I also try to subscribe to the 12 points in the Scout law. The Scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Now, I learned those words and their meanings over 20 years ago. It's, I said 30 at the first service. It's, it's 28, if you want to know for sure. <laughs> I'm holding on. But uh, there's two points of the scout law that, that I really hold near and dear. The first one is a scout is thrifty. Now, that does not mean to be cheap, as my kids say. At least that's not my interpretation of it. Mine is more about being deliberate with the resources that we're given, including finances. And the other being reverent, reverent to your Lord and how we serve and represent our God. Now, in addition to the 28 years, not 30, you know, getting wiser, not older, I noticed that some body parts function a little bit less than they did or less efficiently than they did. And my correlation to that is the, the old saying about time, giving your time, talent, and treasure. The more that we can give as an individual but also as a church body, the more of us that are standing side by side each other, the more efficient our body runs. If all of our parts were working, if all of us were giving, doing, and sharing, just think about how efficient and what kind of impact we can make in our community. I'd like to think of it as ha having a wider base or a, a solid foundation to build off of and instead of having the Leaning Tower of Pisa as our church body that we truly had that, that solid foundation. I'm grateful as a member here of First United Methodist Church now for a little over four years. I've moved 12 times in 18 years. I'm the CEO for the Boy Scouts here. They move us about as much as the Methodist pastors is a long running joke that I've heard. But I'm grateful and, I, and I, we, our family chose this church because of all that we do outside of the walls. That's important for me. Because much like the scouts, I think the community looks to us to be leaders and to help drive the bus instead of just be passengers on the bus. So what I ask of, of you is to join us in prayer with your giving. Whether it's tithing or giving, help us do more. If more of us give and share, again, think about the impact we can do. I'm also grateful for the youth programs we have here at the church. I'm grateful that my son is going out and feeding the homeless once a month. I'm grateful that we had chances to do retreats and, and continue to serve more and more youth and families in our community. And I'll close with the irony of, of the theme being Here I Am, Lord. That was one of my favorite songs growing up. And I already told Weldon during first service I would not sing or hum or any of that. So um, with that, again, please uh, pray on it and give what you can. Allow us as a church body to be able to make a budget off of gifts instead of just numbers that we pull out of the sky that we think we can do. I'm very grateful for the, the financial responsibility of this church that we do operate off of a budget based on giving. And with that, have a great day. Thank you, Mike. Again, we want to welcome you here this morning. Let's prepare now to worship our Lord.
Please stand and join with me in our invitation found in your order of worship. Come and bless the Lord. Christ hears the cries of our hearts. Have faith, for Christ has called us here. Let us pray. Merciful God, hear us as we call to you this day. Speak to us in this holy time. Enter our lives and heal our hurts, that we may hear your truth and trust in your grace. Claim us as your own, that we may go forth in the wholeness of faith. Amen. of reading this morning comes from Psalm 65. We'll be using verses 1 through 8, and it can be found in your hymnals on page is due to you, O God in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. To you who hear prayer, all flesh shall come because of their sins. When our transgressions prevail over us, you forgive them. Blessed are those whom you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. dread deeds you answer us with deliverance, O God of our salvation, who is the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, who by your strength established the mountains, being girded with might, who stills the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples, so that those who dwell at earth's farthest bounds are afraid at your signs. You make the morning and the evening resound with joy. The peace and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Please share the peace of Christ with your neighbors.
we invite the children to come at this time for the children's story. So kids, come on down to the front. Miss Corville has a message for you. You know, while our friends are coming down, this coming Sunday, we are going to start our Christmas musical rehearsal. So if your children are not part of our Sunday school, but want to be part of this, and we want them to, please have them here at 3 o'clock that afternoon. We're going to hand out parts and get costuming and all that stuff taken care of. And so I'd like to see everybody at 3 o'clock. Now, parents, I want you to mark your calendars for December 7th. We're going to have pancakes with Santa Claus. Oh, I can't hardly wait. Oh, just imagine eating pancakes and Santa pays a visit. I'm going to be so excited. But I'm even more excited because guess what this afternoon is? Yes, get what this afternoon is. Who knows? Trunk or treat. Oh, how exciting. And you know, you're going to bring your bag or your pumpkin or something to put all your treats in. And you're going to walk around and everybody's going to be giving you a treat. And you're going to go, oh, wow. I just love all of this free candy that I'm getting. Oh, man, and some of it is going to be so good, you're going to sneak back to that trunk, put your bag out again so you can get another one. But guess what? It's not really free. Somebody had to pay for that. All of these people that are setting up those trunks had to go to Walmart or Kroger's or one of those Albertsons or one of those good stores and get all that candy to give to you. They had to pay for it. But you know, there is something that's free. Do you know that God sent his son Jesus, and he died on the cross, and he rose again so that we can have eternal life, and it's free. All we have to do is say, Jesus, come live in me. And live our lives according to the rules that he sets down for us. There's 10 of them. And he says, it's free. There's no cost. So I want you to remember that. Live for Jesus. Live the way that Jesus wants us to. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, we're just so thankful for you. We're so thankful that you live in us and others can see you through us. Lord, let us enjoy all the many things that we get to do and know that it's because of you. Amen. Thank you so much, Miss Ann. Our hymn is My Hope is Built, number 368. Please remain seated.
God, we give you thanks this day for your love, for your mercy, for your grace that you pour out to each of us. Psalm 23 says, you anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. When you pour out your love and your mercy to us, our cups runneth over and they spill out to everyone they, that we meet. For your love is not something that can be contained. It's not something that we can keep within us, but it does bubble out and runneth over. We give you thanks this day for that ability to share your love with everyone that we meet, to instill your heart, to see the world through your eyes rather than our own. Lord, sometimes we are tempted to just look at the world how we want to see it. And when we do that, we get what we expect to see. Sometimes we see things that are just horrific. But Lord, help remind us that you have the final word. No matter what we face in this world, you are the one who is in control, not us. So no matter what we face, no matter what loss or grief, no matter what sickness, no matter the addiction, no matter what broken relationships we're struggling through, you are there, dear Lord. We ask for your mercy. We ask for your openness this day. Lord, as we go to be your people, as we leave these doors and become the hands and feet of Christ, we ask for your blessing. We ask for your blessing for those who are traveling to Beverly, Kentucky with our church to do a mission team at Redbird this day. Lord, and for everyone who is trying to be the hands and feet of Christ, we ask for your blessings and your mercy to let everyone see the light of Christ that rests within us. Give us that boldness. Give us the ability to do your will, no matter what. I ask all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught all of his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thine will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn is Something Beautiful. It'll be on page 394. We'll sing it twice. Would you please stand for this hymn? And then we'll be seated for our scripture. <laughs> Please be seated. 
from James chapter 5, verses 7 through 11. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you'll be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count them blessed, those who have, who have persevered. You've heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. World Series Game 5 is tonight. Astros and the Nationals, 7 p.m. You have one of three votes. You can vote for the Nationals. You can vote for <laughs> the Astros. Or you can vote for I don't care. All right? Who is pulling for the Nationals tonight? It's a judgment-free zone. <laughs> Who's going for the Astros tonight? Who doesn't care? <laughs> I, I judge you a little bit. <laughs> It'll be fun. A famous television commercial back for Heinz Ketchup came out several years ago. I don't know if you remember it, but it's two little kids, and they're getting their hamburgers together, and they're putting ketchup on the hamburger, and the ketchup, the Heinz ketchup, is going so slowly out of the bottle, and they're just having problems waiting for it. And as they're waiting, Carly Simon's song, Anticipation, is playing in the background. Good commercial, and it has to do with patience. I want us to concentrate for a minute on the book of James, chapter 5, verse 7. It reads like this, Be patient then until the Lord's coming. I want us to notice something here. He doesn't say, be patient for the rest of the day. He doesn't say, be patient until tomorrow. He doesn't say, be patient for a week. He says, be patient until what? The Lord's coming. Be patient until the Lord's coming. In other words, be patient until the end of the age. Be patient until the end of time. The Apostle James points out a good role model for us from the Old Testament. He talks about the patience of Job in our scripture reading for today. Now, Job had almost everything going against him. I mean, he suffered incredibly. His whole world fell apart on him. But through it all, he kept his faith and he kept his patience. The patience of Job. I don't know about you this morning. But I really need patience every single day. I really do. I need patience at Walmart. I need patience at the bank, especially the drive through window. I need patience at Subway. I need patience driving my car when someone behind me is practically driving in my bumper the whole time. I need patience every time I have to call for technical assistance because it takes forever, have you noticed that? I'm sure you have, forever to reach a real live person instead of talking to a computer voice. I really shake my head when that automated voice says, thank you for your patience. I want to say, yeah, for my patience. If you could see me right now, you wouldn't be thanking me for my patience. I was on hold this past week for one solid hour, on hold, and then I hung up, I gave up. I need patience every time I fly on a trip. The check-in, airport security, the tiny seats, that little bag of pretzels they give you. Why even give you anything like that little bag of pretzels? The, pit, the people sitting next to me with their arms on my armrest. On a recent trip, the last trip that I took a couple of months ago, somebody across the aisle, clearly in my line of sight, had taken off her shoes and socks and had propped up her naked feet right there on the back of the, the seat cushion. Don't do that when you fly. 
Nobody wants to see your toes for hours and hours. How gross is that? James said, be patient until the Lord comes. I need that. I came across a good website this past week that has the title, How Much Time Does the Average Person Spend Waiting? According to that article, Americans today spend 32 minutes waiting for a doctor's appointment, 28 minutes waiting in security lines at the airport. Most Americans spend 13 hours every year waiting on hold for customer service like I did this past week. The average American spends 38 hours every year waiting in traffic. I don't think that survey included people in Lake Charles and Sulphur who are crossing the bridge, or it'd be a lot longer than that. In a grand total, Americans spend over 37 billion hours waiting in line every year. Nobody likes to wait. That's one of the reasons that I personally love the microwave oven. To me, that's one of the greatest inventions ever. It's so fast. A baked potato, boom, 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 seven minutes. Popcorn? three minutes. Soup, two minutes. It's so fast. I love it. I love the television DVR for that reason. You record something and you can fly through the commercials. I can watch 60 minutes in 45 minutes. <laughs> it's so fast. Everybody gets impatient, right? Everybody. The rich and the poor, the young, the old, Democrats, Republicans, those with big fancy hairdos, those with no hairdos, Baptists, Catholics, Lutherans, even Methodists. Everybody gets impatient. All of us have been there. We've all done that. I think about families that get all excited about the big summer vacation, been looking forward to this. They load up the vehicle. They get on the interstate for the big trip. Ten minutes down the road, the first question is asked, which is what? We all know it. Are we there yet? We can't wait to get there. Tom Petty had a good song in 1981 with the words, Waiting is the hardest part. Even the preacher needs patience, sometimes a lot of it. I was at another church several years ago in a land far away where a couple of church members were actually critical because unchurched kids were coming to the youth group and a couple of those kids were smoking outside the building, and they had skateboards and hoodies. I had to have a meeting with the parents and to say, hey, look, it's those kids, in addition to our kids, that we want to reach with the message of Christ. It's not just our kids. It's all kids. At different churches, preachers sometimes hear, oh, we need more Bible studies. Or we hear, oh, the church has too many Bible studies, or the Bible studies are too hard. In some churches, the pastor is told, it's too hot in the sanctuary. That's never said here. <laughs> Pastors hear, the music is too loud. The church has too many meetings, or the church doesn't have enough meetings. Or how about this one? Your sermon, Brother Weldon, is always too short, said no one ever except my dear mother back in the day. <laughs> Let me tell you, pastors need patience too, like everybody else. Several years ago, somebody asked the great prime minister of England, William Pitt, a question. They asked him to name the first qualification for the prime minister of England. He thought about it and he said, patience. Then the questioner said, what about a second qualification? He thought about it and he said, patience. And then they said a third qualification, and he said once again, patience. The Bible's very clear about it. We all need patience. Here's what the scripture said about patience. I've asked the choir to help me out with this. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32. Better a patient person than a warrior, a person who controls his temper than one who takes a city. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 11. 
A man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to overlook an offense. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 15. Through patience, a ruler can be persuaded, and a gentle tongue can break a bone. In Colossians, it says, as God's chosen people, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Okay, thank you, choir. In the scripture, the word for patience is macrothumia. It's a combination of two Greek words. Macro, that means large or widespread, like macrobiology, or going to McDonald's and eating a Big Mac. <laughs> the second word is thumia, that means suffering. So it means long-suffering. It means having a very long fuse. Macrothumia. We're called to be long-suffering. James said, be patient then until the Lord comes. Be patient. I want us to consider this morning two things about patience. They're both very simple. Here they are at the beginning. What happens if we don't have it? And number two, how we can get it. So consider the first thing. What happens if we don't have patience? If our patience is gone, what happens? Somebody once said it like this, when our patience runs low, uh-oh, and we lose our cool. It's gone. It just goes right out the window, and there is anger, and there is frustration, and that is never good. If our patience is gone, we honk the horn. Now, I'm not talking about a little toot. You know, the little toot's kind of like saying, uh, hey, the light's green, poop, that's okay. But the long honk. That's different. We honk the horn. We stomp the foot. We raise our voice. We make that phone call or we send that email or that text and we get madder and madder and madder and sometimes like a cherry bomb, we just explode. Gandhi said it like this, to lose patience is to lose the battle. And that's so true. To lose patience is to lose the battle. When our patience runs low, uh-oh. And for all of us in the church, if we lose patience, it's just devastating. It's a bad witness to people in the community for us to lose our patience. If I go shopping here in town and I have a bad experience and I just let the manager have it, I mean, I tell him or her like it is. I just unload on that person. It makes me feel pretty good for a minute. And I walk out to my car and there's a clergy sticker on my car or a First Methodist sticker on my car. Well, that's a fine how do you do. What kind of witness is that for Christ? Something else, it's bad for us health-wise. It really is. It's bad for us physically if we lose our patience. A big study of 3,000 people had this finding. Those of us who get impatient are twice as likely to get high blood pressure. And yet, in spite of that, so many people say, Lord, give me patience and give it to me right now. If we lose our patience, uh-oh. This morning, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be like that. I want to be like Jesus. I want to learn to be patient. There's a great story in the Gospels about Jesus teaching one day to a crowd of people. And a group of little children wanted to see Jesus. And they were pushing their way through the crowd because they wanted to see Jesus and talk to Jesus and touch him. But his disciples got in the way and they said, no, 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 kids. He's teaching right now. He's too busy. Go away. And Jesus heard that. And he said, stop and let the children come to me for of such is the kingdom of heaven. What an amazing story. Jesus had patience. Let the children come to me. And now a second thing to consider that's so important. How in the world can we get patience? How can I get patience in my life? And I want us to make this personal. How can you find patience in your life this coming week? Now, unfortunately, there's no easy formula. I can't take a pill for it. I can't go to Amazon.com and order it. I can't just snap my fingers and think I'll get it. There's a good episode of Seinfeld several years ago where George Costanza's father, Frank Costanza, would say, Serenity now! 
serenity now. And he believed by saying serenity now, he would get peace. It doesn't work. I've tried it over and over again. So back to the question, how do we get patience? Here's the answer. It only comes to us from the gracious hand of God, plain and simple. It comes to us if we come to the Lord and we surrender our lives to him and we ask God for patience. If we say, Lord, I want to be like Jesus. I want to live like Jesus. I want to be patient like Jesus. Fill me, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit can help us to be patient until the Lord comes. I was reading this past week about Thomas Edison. He was a genuine American hero. In his lifetime, in 84 years, he had over a thousand inventions. He was something else. He had been working day and night, day and night, trying to figure out the secret to get the light bulb to start working, but he couldn't do it. He'd been working for months and months, but he couldn't quite figure it out. Finally, late one night, he came out of his lab, and he looked so tired, he was exhausted. A friend was there, and he asked him a question. He said, how many experiments have you already done? And he answered, over 1,900. His friend said, over 1,900? That has to be so disappointing, such a failure. And Thomas Edison stopped for a minute, and he stood up tall, and he said, not at all. I don't feel like a failure. I've made a lot of progress because now I know 1,900 things that don't work. And one of these days, I'm going to find the answer. And he did. That is patience. It's long-suffering. And the Holy Spirit can do that for us if we ask him and if we trust him. This morning, I'm so grateful for the people in my life who have shown patience to me over the years. My mother and father my teachers, preachers I've had, my scoutmaster, district superintendents, bishops. I'm so thankful for all of you as church members and people who attend First Methodist for showing me patience that I really need to have. And I'm especially thankful for the grace of God and the patience of God in dealing with my soul. I really am. And here's the great news for me. God's not finished with me yet. And here's the great news for you, too. God is not finished with you either. For everybody here today, doesn't matter if you're 9 years old or 99 years old, God is not finished with you yet. I want us to hear that so clearly. God has plans for you, wonderful plans. And part of that awesome plan is for God's Holy Spirit to touch your life and fill you with his presence and help you and help me to be more patient and patient every single day. The word of God for today is this. Be patient, my brothers and sisters, until the Lord comes. Let us pray. Lord, James really steps on our toes. James really gets our attention. And he talks about things, Father, that we need to hear, including patience. So, Lord, thank you for this word from James today. Forgive us for the times that we have been impatient. And help me, help all of us in this sanctuary today to call upon you every day to fill us with your spirit and for us to be more patient. Hear our prayer in Christ's holy name. Amen. Now let us stand and affirm our faith together through the words of the Apostles' Creed found in your order of worship. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, thank you that you are not finished with any of us here today. Thank you, Lord, for this offering. May this offering spread that good news around this community. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. hymn is number 347, beautiful short hymn titled Spirit Song. This morning as we sing this hymn, I invite you to commit to the fellowship of the church to give your heart and life to Christ by coming to the front, joining the church if you are not a member. Number 347.
you all so much. You do an amazing job every week, and you did again today. And we appreciate Paul and Taylor playing for us today. Um, I don't know if you all know that Paul is Emmy's fiance. That's not a secret, is it? Okay. No. It's not anymore. But Paul, raise your hand. That's, that's Emmy's fiance. Thank you all very much for being with us. Um, those of you who are considering making First Methodist your church home, I do invite you to come and join us for Pizza with the Pastor in Paxton Hall. We'll have a great time together. Trunk or Treat is at 5 p.m. this afternoon. It's always a lot of fun. Uh, if you have kids or grandkids or no kids at all, come and join us. We have hot dogs and a great time of fellowship. Look forward to seeing you then. Next week, we'll be continuing our sermon series on Journey Through James with a sermon on complaining about each other. It's a message I need to hear, and some of you might need to, too. And we'll be in here, and we'll have a good word together. As you go forth from this place, remember that when you lose patience, you lose the battle. Don't lose the battle today. Go now in peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.